Hello, it's Sarah the Tudor Travel Guide here and welcome back to this month's A to Z of Tudor Places where we will be focusing on the letter S and one of my favourite Tudor locations in the country and that is of course Sudley Castle in Gloucestershire. Sudley Castle is without doubt one of the most popular destinations on any Tudor road trip itinerary and with good reason my friends. It's 15th century ruins all set amidst pretty gardens and gorgeous Cotswold countryside make it romantic and it of course also packs a punch in terms of its Tudor history for it was not only visited by the likes of Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth I but for a short time during the summer of 1548 it was home to a Tudor queen and her husband Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour. Catherine would give birth to her only child at Sudley and sadly consequently die there several days later of puerperal fever. And fun fact, my friends, she is in fact the only English queen to be buried on private land. She lies beneath a fine marble tomb in Sudley's chapel, although her remains have not always enjoyed such peaceful repose and if you want to read more about that shocking story then make sure to check out my very popular blog. However before we go on and talk about these events and the history of Sudley as ever I just wanted to remind you that if you are enjoying this video and indeed the channel then please do hit the like and subscribe button so that you get notified of course when any new videos are released. Okay my friends well as ever it's back to our story and back to our history and as ever let's just fill in the first part of our story by talking about the origins of the castle and how the present building in fact came into being. Well, the first man who made his mark on Sudley Castle was a certain Ralph Botlier, B-O-T-E-L-E-R, never quite sure how to pronounce it. But nevertheless, he acquired the estate in 1417 when he was just 21 years old. However, Ralph, who was Baron Sudley, spent much of his time thereafter in France, fighting against the French and serving the young King Henry VI, who became king in his minority. He was first appointed as counsellor to the king, then bodyguard, and finally he became the king's chamberlain. So in fact, Butlier was a man of enormous importance and status, and to note also a staunch Lancastrian, which becomes relevant during the Wars of the Roses, which of course would follow. Now in July 1441, he returned from France to settle permanently in England and it was around this time that Baron Sudley began to build a castle we know today. And in his 16th century itinerary by John Leyland, who we've come across before, well he states that the original manor in fact was located in Sudley Park, thought to most likely lie to the east of the present gardens. And so, starting from new foundations, Ralph Botlier commissioned the construction of his new fine double courtyard moated manor house to the west of the original manor on the site we see today. Then, of course, we come to the Wars of the Roses and the rise of the House of York. Well, I've already said Botlier was a Lancastrian, so he was stripped of his titles and offices and subsequently he retired to his state in 1461. The following year he was exempted from having to attend the council or hold office due to his age and infirmity. He was by then 73 years old, so an old man, and he finally sold the estate to Edward IV, probably on account of having no heirs himself. Now in turn Edward gave Sudley to his younger brother, Richard, Duke of Gloucester. And during Richard's nine-year tenure of Sudley, it is believed that it was he who was responsible for the construction of the truly magnificent East Range, 
which would in time, of course, become home to Catherine Parr and her husband, Thomas Seymour. This range is therefore of particular interest to those of us who want to get close to Henry VIII's most erudite of queens. Now, eventually, Richard handed Sudley back to his brother, Edward IV, and it therefore remained the property of the crown. And it was because, or partly because it was property of the crown, that it was visited by Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn during the long summer progress of 1535, before it was eventually given to Thomas Seymour, who became the new Baron Sudley in 1548, after the death of Henry VIII. His brother, of course, became the new Lord Protector. And it was at this point that Thomas refurbished the castle in preparation for bringing home his new bride, the then, of course, widowed Catherine Parr. Catherine was pregnant and the couple would while away the summer months at Sudley in anxious anticipation of the birth of their first child. Now, just as an aside, by the way, if you'd like to tune in to hear me and Phil Downing from Tudor Tours, talk about Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour at Sudley Castle, then you can do so by following the link above or I will put a link in the description below. Today, Sudley is in part an intact family home, but the ruins of an earlier range, the aforementioned range, now lies within the gardens and they have been described as one of the finest examples of late 15th century royal architecture that you are likely to see anywhere. Now let's talk a little bit about the layout of the castle because it is a bit different today. During the 15th and 16th centuries the main entrance to Sudley Castle was via a gatehouse in the North Range. Today the front of this range and that gatehouse can only be seen from afar as you wind your way from the ticket office through the incredibly picturesque remains of Bottelier's 15th century barn. That gatehouse, which was modified in the late 16th century, as I've said, can still be seen at a distance. Although originally you need to imagine that it was protected by a moat and a drawbridge and it opened up into the outer courtyard, much as it is today, although that outer courtyard is not accessible to the public. It is surrounded by the private lodgings used by the family today. Dividing the outer from the inner courtyard was once a two-storey range, which was at some point demolished and replaced by a single-storey Victorian gallery, which you can still see in place today. And therefore, beyond that, now where the ruined East Range lies and the gardens was in fact the original inner courtyard. The extant so-called dungeon tower at the end of the West Range marks the limit of that original inner courtyard and it was connected to its opposite East Range where you can see the current ruins by a now lost Great Hall. Now for the Tudor enthusiast, of course, it's the ruined East Range, which is the most significant part of the castle, perhaps with the exception of the chapel where Catherine lies buried. For this range contained the most opulent and glamorous chambers in the castle. They were the principal private chambers. Originally, as I've mentioned, they were built by Richard, Duke of Gloucester, and these, this range would have contained those rooms used by Richard and its subsequent royal owners, including Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour. According to the eminent architectural historian Anthony Emery, who we've heard from before, this wing contained six chambers. There were three on the ground floor and three, possibly four, on the first floor. The largest, the middle chamber, so-called principal chamber, is the one that remains partially standing today and which so attracts the eye because the quality of the carved stonework of the mullioned windows simply speaks of the grandeur, wealth and status of the man who commissioned the work. Of course, the future King Richard III. Now, beyond this principal room at first floor level 
at the southern end, closest to the now lost Great Hall, was the most private inner chamber into which the Dowager Queen might withdraw to the company of her husband or her sister Anne Herbert or her principal maid of honour in residence at Sudley, Lady Jane Grey. And here, one imagines Catherine passed a great deal of time in conversation, doing needlework, or reading from devotional texts as she awaited the birth of her child. Sadly though, nothing is left of this room except one tiny part of a window frame. See if you can spot it if you visit today. But it is entirely possible that this inner chamber led through into a further suite of rooms in a residential tower block, one which mirrored that at the end of the Western Range, the aforementioned dungeon tower. If so, then it likely contained within its chamber block, Catherine's bedchamber, where of course she would give birth and would subsequently die following the delivery of her baby girl on Wednesday the 5th of September 1548. It is thought that there may well have been a small private chapel inside the privy lodgings, but the principal chapel at Sudley lies amidst its exquisite English gardens. Now these gardens are a true delight in the height of summer with delicate tinkling of the fountain at the centre of the parterre and the riot of colour from a profusion of blooms or the sweet scent of roses in the rose garden. And I think it's one of the reasons why this location is beloved by so many. A chapel is something to behold and we should remember that there's always been a chapel on the site that the current chapel sits on today but the one that you see today is in fact a Victorian recreation for the original was destroyed as was part of the castle during the English Civil War. The castle and the chapel then fell into neglect but we should remember that it once lay beyond the moat and was connected to those privy chambers in the eastern wing by a pentis. And today a metal framed walkway marks out the original position of the pentis. And if you follow it, you will find yourself gazing upon the sparse remains of a privy oratory in which the likes of Catherine Parr and Thomas Seymour could have observed the service going on in the chapel in private. Now, speaking of inside the chapel, well, the interior is indeed beautiful, although it is, of course, a later recreation. And you will find the Victorian marble tomb of Catherine Parr next to the high altar. I've already said that the story of her death is one thing, but what happened to her body over the ensuing centuries is really a shocking tale. And you may well want to read more about that. And as I've said before, you can either click the link above or check out the link in the description below. Now, what if you want to visit Sudley? Well, of course, I'd recommend you check out their website. The link will be in the description below for all the latest information. There are refreshments on site. There's a great shop, there are toilets and a generous car park. But I should say that dogs are not allowed inside the grounds. So perhaps it is best to leave your pooch at home if you are planning a visit. Sudley Castle is also part of the Historic Houses Association, which is an organisation where once you become a member, you can get free access to those properties which are part of its membership. And you might consider becoming a member if you plan to visit around four or five properties a year, all of whom are members of the scheme, or during your visit if you're coming from overseas. Now, if you want to check out whether it's worthwhile you doing, you might want to read more by visiting my blog, which is called Visiting the UK, A History Lover's Essential Guide, where there's all sorts of information about how you can save time and money on your Tudor road trip, particularly if you're visiting from overseas. And finally, if you have a car, just a few miles away from Sudley are the ruins of Hales Abbey. It was once a site of visitation made by Cromwell's men during the 1535 progress when Anne Boleyn and Henry were staying at Sudley. It's the whole saga around the duck's blood. And if you want to know more about that, then 
there is a podcast that I have done with Michael Carter from English Heritage who talks about the dissolution of the monasteries and mentions the role of the duck's blood at Hales Abbey. And again, once more, you might want to check out the link below in the description if you want to hear more about that. But Hales Abbey is a beautiful site, particularly on a warm summer's day. It is peaceful and idyllic, even though, of course, the abbey was long since dissolved and now lies in fragments and ruins. Okay, so there is plenty to do for a full day out at Sudley and remember that during the year they have all sorts of events going on such as Tudor reenactment. So once again, another good reason for checking out their website and trying to coincide your visit with something that little bit extra special. It just puts the icing on the cake. Well, that's it. That's all for this month's A to Z of Tudor Places. I hope you've enjoyed our little potted history of Sudley Castle and particularly pointing out some of the highlights associated with the stay of Catherine Parr at the castle in 1548. So that's it and all that remains for me to say until we meet again for next month's episode of A to Z when I'll be tackling the letter D is of course my friends wherever you are in the world happy time traveling mm -hmm.